Hi everyone, uh, today I'm going to be speaking as seen over here in the title Implementing Trigonometry in SESS uh, and the lessons I learned along the way. So my name is Wei Yuan, I'm from Rotterdam Vicky. Let's get started. Okay, all tales start with a hero to be, uh, a young lad, a young maiden on an adventure. And uh, I, I want to tell my story in this same manner as well. The journey that I undertook along the way uh, to go on this mad impulse to implement trigonometry in SESS. Okay, so... As all adventures, there's always quests that you need to complete along the way. And my quest was this thing. So this is a preloader icon. Uh, you can see there's multiple hexagons in there, uh, rotating in different orientations. So there's four hexagons in total. Okay? And every adventure, you always have some sort of final boss that you have to kill. And in my case, I just need to embed this loader into this website, uh, supi.com. So it's already there today. We did this one year ago. Uh, and yeah, I'm just uh, going to recount my journey to you. So to solve this problem, there are multiple solutions that you can adopt, uh, but uh, unfortunately, I've already spoiled it because uh, it's an irresistible title. Uh, but bear with me, uh, I will bring you along the journey of the different solutions that can be used here as well, but why we didn't choose them. So the first and most simple solution. So if you have an animation like that, why not create a GIF and just load it on your web page? Uh, Side note, is it GIF or GIF? Uh, for the majority of this presentation, I will just pronounce it as GIF, so don't hate me. Okay, so how do you use a GIF uh, within a web application? You create the GIF first, and you host it somewhere, and then lastly, you just put the URL inside your web page, inside image tag, and that's it. So essentially, because I'm hosting my slides on the web page, uh, this is the same effect as what I showed you earlier on. Uh, of just linking the image within this uh, slides, okay? And this is what you we would get if you're using a GIF. So why would you want to use a GIF? Okay, it's very simple. If you have created it, you host it somewhere, it's plug and play. You just put it in an image tag uh, and your job is done. Okay, but why would you not want to use it instead if the solution is so simple? Okay, one of the issues here is that uh, okay, I'm sorry if the color is a little bit bad, uh, but I'm just gonna read it out. So the file size can get really big even at low resolutions. So just to show you, uh, when I'm looking at my network tab, that uh, GIF that I showed you earlier on, it costs around 97.5 97 kilobytes. So let's say if the total uh, cost of your assets of uh, CSS and JavaScript uh, assets in your site costs around 100 kilobytes, loading this preloader will twice the cost for your users. So it's not necessarily a desirable outcome for your user in terms of user experience, because it will take longer for them to load assets within your page. Okay. Another issue is uh, FPS rate. So if you're looking at optimize the file size of a GIF, you might be thinking about what if I reduce the frame rate of my GIF, uh, but then you get stuttering animations. Again, not very good for user experience. Okay. And as all, all image assets, uh, except for SVG, you always have this resizing issue. So if you need the, this GIF or this, this animation to be produced at a much more larger resolution, you try and scale it upwards, you see that you get the image looking more pixelated. So that's problematic. Uh, you end up having to create this uh, image asset at the larger resolution all over again. So uh, that's a scaling problem. Okay, and lastly, um, even as a software engineer, I don't, even, I, I don't really know how to use Photoshop to create the GIF, so uh, I have to get my design team to help me recreate it all over again. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of a problem. I can't really do the solution myself. Okay, so if GIFs doesn't work, uh, what about using third-party libraries instead. So as I would call it, the art of Tai Chi, moving the problem to make, other, make it other people's problem. Okay, so uh, for the sake of the discussion today, uh, I'm gonna be talking about this library that we experimented on. It's called Lotte Files. Uh, I'll explain why we chose this uh, in a bit, okay? So how do you use third-party libraries like Lotte Files, okay? So in this case, uh, you need to create the animation uh, either using an online editor or some uh, Photoshop plugin that they've provided, okay? And then you export the output, uh, in this case, in JSON file, and you will load the animation library uh, in relation to Lotte files, so they have their own uh, SDK, web SDK for this, and load the JSON file to recreate the animation. So I have a code pen over here, so essentially this should show that, let me try and make this, ah, can't. Okay, so basically I will just describe on the top part over here, you can see that I've uh, include the, uh, I've loaded the uh, web SDK for Lotte files, and then on the lower part over here, you can see that I'm loading the JSON file. Okay, so immediately I get the animation, uh, the preloader icon that I want. Uh, 
Okay. Okay. So why would we choose to use a solution like this? Okay. Uh, immediately, one of the huge benefits here is that the file size of this JSON file is very small. It's optimized for delivery of this uh, assets. So uh, I looked at it in the network console. It's 1.2 kilobytes for that. It's a much more. It's a huge improvement, almost night and day when you compare it to the GIF solution, uh, as discussed earlier on. And it's very simple to use. Uh, similar to the other one, instead of just including a GIF uh, URL, you're now looking at including the JavaScript asset, loading it within your page, and then the second step is to load the JSON file. Still relatively simple. Okay? And one of the reasons uh, that our designers chose to use this library was to allow their work to scale across multiple platforms. So not just being able to use the JSON file within uh, our web application, you can also use it within uh, the, our Android app as well as our iOS app if they install the corresponding SDKs for that. Okay. But there are also problems in regards to using this uh, library. Um, again, Photoshop skills, I don't really have Photoshop skills, so I can't really recreate. Like, let's say if I need to change the color, I need to get someone else to do it for me. So not a very scalable practice. Uh, another issue is high initialization cost. So the idea is that even though the file size of uh, like 1.2 kilobytes per JSON file is very small, you know, I can do 100 uh, animations and it's equivalent to the cost of the earlier solution. The issue is that what if I'm just loading for one single preloader, you know, like my situation over here? Essentially, I get a situation where I need to load the initial web SDK for this uh, Lotte files. And you can see over here, it cost around 58 kilobytes. So in total, I would take around 60 kilobytes just to recreate this animation. It's not that far away as compared to the uh, earlier GIF solution. So not exactly the desirable outcome that we want. Okay, so if solutions on the path of least resistance like GIFs doesn't work, and if we can't choose something like a third-party library uh, to implement as our long-term and short-term solution, uh, let's try and implement it ourselves. And side note, if you try to do this, uh, trigonometry, uh, like for myself, when I was looking at it on a Wikipedia, my manager uh, happened to saw me reading it and he was like asking me, why, why are you reading trigonometry? It's not part of your job. Uh, <laughs> but it still came out with something awesome, so yeah. Okay, so let's try and implement it, uh, that, uh, this problem with CSS. So just a very brief run through uh, how do you use CSS. Uh, it's just configuration, put it within a style sheet, load the style sheet in your web page, and basically you're done. Okay, but the core of the problem essentially is how do you recreate that animation in CSS? Okay, so let's break it down into sizable chunks. Uh, just now you saw earlier on, there's uh, a couple of hexagons that are rotating in different orders. So one of the core problems is, how do you draw a hexagon using CSS? Okay, and then there's the rotation animation. And you have to draw hexagons at different sizes. So there's four hexagons of different sizes. And not only a rotation animation in one direction, you need to uh, take into account the rotation in different directions. Okay, so in examining these four sub-problems, we see that the rotation animation is a problem that is relatively easy to solve. You can just use the keyframe uh, rule, uh, implement the transform property going from, uh, with a rotation value going from 0% or 0 degrees to 360 degrees, and basically just apply that as part of your animation uh, in an infinite loop. So that's very simple to solve in CSS. Hexagons of different sizes in CSS is basically just uh, scaling things up and down. So again, another very simple problem to solve. Clockwise, anti-clockwise rotation uh, simply just means that uh, the earlier rotation animation, the solution, you just need to do it such that you have both the anti-clockwise orientation and the clockwise uh, orientation. And let's say you apply it as part of the class names to the hexagons that's supposed to rotate in those orientations. So that one is very simple. Okay, so we end up with this last problem. How do you draw a hexagon in CSS? Um, you could draw, I mean, okay, let's say if you're drawing a square, you just need to get a div, you put a border, you're done. A uh, rectangle is basically just the height and length being different. Uh, and circle is border radius. You set it such that it becomes a circle. But how about a six-sided shape? How do you draw it in CSS? Uh, one of the ways I found out is that uh, to draw it efficiently, you, uh, to use the minimum amount of uh, DOM elements, you can use one single div. Uh, use a div, draw the, or rather, just uh, initialize the top and bottom border. Use the before selector, do the same for the top and bottom border but uh, rotate it 60 degrees, and then do the same for the after selector as well, uh, but this time rotate negative uh, 60 degrees. So you end up having these six sides of the hexagon. Okay? So this should mean that we have solved the problem of drawing the hexagon. But it turns out, 
you end up with something like this. So there's a fatal error that I made over here, which is that the assumption that the height is equivalent to the side of the hexagons. So this assumption works if you are drawing a square, uh, but if you're drawing a hexagon, obviously it doesn't work. So how do we correct the length of the hexagon, the sides of each of these hexagons so that we can draw it properly? Okay, so we have to examine the hexagon even further. And when you look at the hexagon, essentially what you end up with is uh, multiple right-angled triangles that you can draw over here. And with right-angled triangles, essentially is basically I'm alluding towards trigonometry. Okay, so to implement trigonometry, uh, essentially you need some sort of uh, functions that you need to create to compute uh, and get you the trigonometric functions and the values that you want, essentially. So we need to have some sort of way to program it. Essentially, you can't do it in CSS, so let's look at using uh, SAS instead in the SCSS syntax. Okay, so how do we solve this problem in SAS? Okay, so before we go into implementing the trigonomet trigonometric functions, uh, we want to first identify what functions do we want to implement. Okay, so uh, again, hashtag Twakaso. So this is kind of like the cheat code. Uh, I'm not sure if how many, how many of you all remember in secondary school, uh, the way to remember uh, the basic trigonometric formulas. So twa essentially just means uh, tangent of some angle equivalent to the opposite divided by uh, the adjacent side of a right-angled triangle. And then it's basically the same for ka, which is cosine equals a over h, and then sine, which is uh, so, which is uh, opposite over hypotenuse. Okay, so let's examine these three formulas. Which one is useful in terms of getting the solution that we want? Uh, firstly, if you look at the cosine formula, cosine of 30 degrees is equivalent to the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. Uh, essentially, the, what we want over here is that when you look at the, this right-angled triangle, we want to compute the value of O and use that value after that, multiply by 2 to get the side of a hexagon. So because the cosine formula doesn't have O, essentially it's not really a formula that we can use. So let's remove that. Uh, okay, so we have these two other formulas remaining. So for the sine formula, uh, you see that, okay, we know the value, we can compute the value of sine 30 degrees. And uh, we have the O value that we want to find out as well. But hypotenuse is also uh, unknown to us. So we can't really use this formula to get anything, to get the value of O out of it. So let's eliminate that. And you end up with the tangent formula. So we know the value of tangent 30 degrees, or this is something we want to compute later. We know the value of A, which is essentially half the height of the hexagon. So if we reshuffle this formula, we should be able to reach a state where we can extract the value of O from there. Okay, so then we reach this uh, point, which is how do you implement trigonometry in uh, SAS? Okay, so I was, disclaimer, I'm not a, a math expert. Um, so I look around the internet to see how to implement that. And what I found was this thing. Uh, this is the Taylor series expansion for sine. Um, not really sure how to explain this, but essentially uh, what I need to do is to implement this in, in within uh, the SAS function to calculate for sine. Uh, but some of y'all might be thinking, I'm trying to use tangent to get to my answer over here. So why am I looking for sine instead? Turns out that essentially the tangent formula is a derivation from the sine and cosine formulas. And cosine is essentially something you can derive from the sine formula. So if you solve for sine itself, you should be able to solve for tangent as well. Okay, so let's look at implementing this uh, formula as seen over here for sine uh, and write it within some SAS functions. Uh, but first, before we go into you know, taking this whole thing and dumping it on a function, I think what we want to do is to break it down into sizable chunks, uh, preferably reusable com uh, components or functions. So you can see immediately over there, you already have uh, things like in the denominator, you have some factorial values. Uh, essentially, I could write something like a factorial function to uh, co compute those values. Okay, so that's what we did. Um, so code is a little bit small, but I just explained factorial is basically just iteratively, let's say if I have, I'm trying to compute three factorial, I'm just trying to iterate from, let's say, uh, one multiplied by two multiplied by three, get the sum and return, okay? So it's very simple. Uh, but as we were implementing this, we started thinking about, you know, are there ways to optimize this? Because if you look at this formula, essentially at each iteration, each of these values, uh, essentially this is a summation of, uh, for the sign formula, they're trying to get a summation of all of these values to get uh, a, the most accurate value uh, computed from this uh, sign formula. And if you look at each of these iteration, uh, the denominators essentially increase from one another, which is like three factorial, five factorial, seven factorial. 
And if I'm computing them individually, essentially what it, what it means is that I'll compute, let's say, 3 times 2 times 1, and then uh, the next one, which is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and I'll do it all the way until n factorial. So this means that I will I'll do it O n times for each of these denominators, and then I'll compute O n times for each of the factorial values. So I'll end up with O n square runtime for just calculating the factorial values. Uh, but there's actually a simple way to optimize it. If you look at each of these uh, successing values, right, like for example, 5 factorial, essentially you can just use the value of 3 factorial, apply the uh, multiplication of 4 and 5 to get 5 factorial. So we added a small optimization in the factorial function, allowing you to add the previous successful result so that you can uh, actually reduce the runtime for this. So for this sign formula, in the end, for computing the denominator, uh, essentially it's just O n runtime. Sorry, all this math. Very... <sighs> okay, so basically you can do the same for the power, the numerator as well, okay, to reduce the runtime. And so let's say we have solved it for both the power as well as the factorial. Let's move on to implementing the sine function proper. Okay, so for the sine function itself, uh, if you see the top part over there, it's summation to infinity. Uh, but we, live in, uh, we don't live in a perfect world. I can't calculate this forever. So we need to compute, uh, we, we need to do an approximation for this value uh, and get something that is close to what we need. So what we found was that uh, up to the sum of the 10, 10 values, the 11 value itself uh, was so small that uh, it doesn't really, uh, del uh, what, the, what do you call it, the, it doesn't cause the uh, answer to be inaccurate by too much, uh, essentially to the point where you can't find any screen sizes big enough in the world to see even the one pixel error uh, over there. So we found that the first 10 figures summing up was uh, sufficient enough, uh, getting a good approximation for this formula. Okay, so we saved that value in, inside some constant value for our SES function and use that to perform uh, the limits for our iteration. Okay, and essentially, um, again, code is a little bit small, uh, but the main iteration is between this point over here, line 28 to line 35, or line, sorry, 38, uh, where the, you can see the factorial function being called over here. There's also this large chunk of uh, code over here, which is essentially identifying that in a sine function, uh, because the wave function repeats every 360 degrees, you can just normalize it to uh, the value between 0 to 360 degrees. And also, if um, let's say if I'm computing a value of sine 0 degrees or sine 90 degrees, I can just return the value of 0 and 1 right away. Okay, so once we have solved this problem for sine, let's try and solve it for the cosine formula. So because you can derive the formula uh, of cosine from sine, essentially, it's very simple. You just you re code reuse, call the sine function, and return that value uh, coming from there. You just need to augment the, uh, the input going to the sine function. Okay, and for tangent, it's the same thing, code reuse, use both the sine function and cosine function that you implemented earlier on. Okay, so now that we have a tangent function, we should be able to compute the value that we have here along with the input of half the height of the hexagon, and we should be able to get the value of O. And true enough, we managed to get it uh, from there. So you can see over here in the SAS code, uh, the factorial function I implemented, I mentioned earlier on, and the sine function, and then uh, the cosine function as well as the tangent function over here. So uh, indeed, it has shown that this is, uh, it's possible to do it within SAS. So one of the important things over here, let's compare it to the previous solutions. So we looked at the GIF, which costs around 100 uh, kilobytes to load. Uh, we have that third-party library. Uh, again, it's 1.2 kilobytes in terms of the JSON file, and then the animation library, which takes around another 60 kilobytes. Uh, if you look at the CSS solution alone, by itself, the CSS file, if you minify it, you zip it, you load it, it's less than one kilobyte. It's very much a solution that we want to use uh, in terms of optimizing the user experience for loading this animation. Okay, so beyond uh, trigonometry in CSS, uh, I have had this question before where people ask me, okay, GIF doesn't work out, why not just use something like SVG instead? I mean, uh, there's weaknesses to GIFs, like you can't scale it up and down, but you can do it in SVG. And there's, uh, you can do animations in SVG as well. Okay, so... Okay, so I tried it out. Uh, turns out, actually, yeah, it works as well. Uh, you can do uh, this entire thing using SVG. Uh, but the caveat here is that if you look at this polygon over here, uh, so each of these polygons represent a single hexagon within this animation. And if you look at the property over here, points, essentially it's 
it still needs some form of uh, trigonometry to calculate each of the x, y coordinates of the sides of a polygon. So you still have to use trigonometry in some way. Um, but what turns out, so yeah, if you load it in the web page, essentially it's very nice. And it's actually even better than my earlier CSS solution. Uh, slightly smaller than that, 704 bytes. Uh, but I kind of still uh, disagree with this because the idea is that the uh, this creating SVG, let's say if you do it on a server-side code in a Rails application, or if you create some sort of uh, shell script to create this SVG, essentially you're sort of taking it away from your styling tools. Like if I want to create this animation, I would want to, this animation is for my styling purposes. I'd rather couple it with my styling tools like my uh, SAS. Okay, so, but to each JSON, I think this is also a possible solution. Okay, so along the way of preparing for this presentation, this thing came out, like my sign function broke. And I started thinking, so what if my SAS functions start to break in the future? You know, it's possible. Someone can just come in and change the code and cause uh, the code to break. So is there a way to do some form of unit testing for your CSS or your SAS? So the internet is a very nice place. You can, <laughs> if you search it out, eventually you'll come up with answers. So there's this library called True by Oddbird. Uh, you essentially, you can use it uh, to complement your, uh, your testing suite. For example, if you're using Jest to test your JavaScript code, you could use it together with uh, uh, testing your SAS code over here. So just to give an example, I use this to test the running of my factorial function. Uh, and then you could integrate it with Jest as its test runner. And essentially, you should get the testing results that you need, or rather the outcome of being able to test your SAS code. Okay, so I'm almost reaching the end of this. Uh, so reflecting of my adventure over here, going on this impulse to create uh, this hexagon or drawing it using trigonometry. Uh, so we started off with using, uh, looking at using GIFs. I would recall this more as like, you know, if I was uh, way, way younger back then, uh, let's say before I enter uh, school uh, and trying this, let's say I'm trying to solve this problem back then, I would just probably end up with just using GIFs because it's a simple solution, uh, plug and play, very easy. Uh, but as I gain more experience along the way, uh, as an engineer, learning from peers, friends, mentors, people started uh, surfacing the message of, you know, if uh, this problem is already solved, don't try to reinvent the wheel again. Why not just use third-party tools to implement solutions, okay? But then beyond that, you know, when you start working in an industry, you start asking about things like performance. You want to reduce file sizes. You want to make sure things load as fast as possible. So people start looking at performance instead code reuse, you know, ensuring engineering practices, even in code, styling code like this, you know, even for your CSS. Okay, and then sometimes you go crazy, you start thinking about implementing unit tests for SCSS instead. Um, but yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> okay, so what if you want to try and implement trigonometry yourself for CSS? Um, you can also, you can do what I did, uh, but it turns out that, so this is one of the feedback that I was given in my uh, previous discussions. Uh, which I went to look for it, and apparently there's this discussion about implementing uh, trigonometric functions in CSS. Not available yet in browsers, but watch out for it. And yep, that's the end of uh, this presentation. The first question is, why is the code in radians and the formulas in degrees? Um, it's just a presentation thing. Uh. It's, it's essentially the same. Uh, how long do you take to figure all of this out? <laughs> one week? Something like that? I remember it was along the course of one single week of trying to hack it after work. Because it was, it's not really something that was sanctioned in work, but rather something that I wanted to challenge myself and get it done. So yeah, I would say around a week. Implementation was actually a lot shorter. I think it only took a couple of hours. Like the moment you get the, the formula, which I had to revise by going to Wikipedia and like doing, doing stuff, reading it up again. Uh, the moment you get the formula, I think it's actually very simple. Can the factorial values be fixed constants instead? I mean, you can do that. Uh, I just wanted to, like in some sense, uh, one of our core engineering principles, code we use. Uh, I mean, if you can just implement it, uh, that factorial function, you can reuse it again and again in the future. Um, I would say yeah, I'd rather go for that rather than constant values. Uh, but maybe it's also a little bit alluding towards uh, caching. I don't know, like maybe you can do some form of in-memory cache. Let's say you are com computing your sign function. You could just save some of these values in case you are going to uh, reuse it again later. Uh, 
Just curious, isn't tangent 30 degrees a constant? Actually, yeah, that's true. Uh. The... I mean, I just decided to hack it up. I mean, it's, it's fun trying to find, try out something new. You can use it for more stuff. Actually, okay, there's one question that's not asked here, but I just want to answer it, which is, uh, just now when you see the sign, the expanded Taylor series expansion for the sine formula, uh, I've used that to calculate cosine and tangent. Actually, I had this one question before where someone asked me, why don't you just use the Taylor series expansion for tangent? Uh, actually, you can do that. Uh, it's just that I didn't know better at that time, so I went through the long path of sine, cosine, tangent. So uh, if you want to implement tangent, please just use the Taylor series expansion for tangent. Don't, don't go the wrong, long path like me. Uh, why a hexagon? Um, <laughs> sorry, la, I don't get to choose, la, not my design. Okay. Um, like I think this this. Did you consider drawing SVG and animating it using SMIL? I'm sorry, I don't know what's SMIL. So maybe you want to look for me after this. You can find out what's SMIL. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So uh, thank you, Wei Yuan. Okay. Thanks, Wei Yuan.